Hello and welcome to this special event in partnership between the Natural History Museum and the Great Exhibition Road Festival, a year-round festival celebrating the science and the arts from London's cultural hub, Exhibition Road. When was the last time you were somewhere truly magical? For many people, particularly children, the Natural History Museum in London, with its galleries filled with an array of specimens from across the natural world, it can sometimes feel like you're exploring another world and its fantastic beasts. Sometimes fact can seem even more magical than fiction, which is why the latest exhibition from the Natural History Museum in many ways seems like a perfect fit. Fantastic Beasts, The Wonder of Nature brings together the real world science of the museum with the wizarding world as seen in the Warner Brothers film, Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them. Today, we're going to go behind the scenes with three magi-zoologists who each played a part in bringing the wizarding world and the museum world together for the first time. Lorraine Cornish, science lead on the exhibition. Hi. Kate Whittington, exhibitions manager. And Richard Sabin, principal curator of Mammoths. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining me today. Now, I'm sure everyone watching at home, you will have questions for our panel today. So if you want to find out more about what really goes into making an exhibition like this come to life, please pop the questions in the chat and I'll put them to our panel today. It's a really great opportunity uh, to find out firsthand from the people involved what actually goes on. But to start us off, um, Kate, if I could start with you, can you tell us where on earth did an idea for an exhibition like this actually come from? It actually started out initially as an idea for a documentary. So we came together with the BBC Natural History Unit um, and quickly realized there was a fantastic exhibition in this idea as well. So we worked with Warner Brothers and the Blair Partnership as well. So Warner Brothers to um, bring in all of those incredible film props um, and help us bring the magical beasts to life and the Blair Partnership to kind of keep us on track with all that wizarding world knowledge. So they, they're the people that we went to when we had questions about like, what's the plural for alchemy? <laughs> um, and other bizarre questions that we asked ourselves over the past couple of years. So, but we quickly realized that the, these partners had um, a really shared vision um, and, and drew upon creativity, drawing from the natural world. Um, and so centering around that character of Newt Scamander, who for anyone that doesn't know is a magizoologist in the wizarding world. So he studies magical creatures and he wrote a book called Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them, which is what the film franchise is also named after. Um, and he traveled the world studying, uh, discovering these fantastic beasts um, documenting their behaviors and their unique traits, but also campaigning for their protection. So understanding what threats they face. And we began to see, see so many parallels um, with the real world, with the aims of our institution to develop advocates for the natural world and also the work of our in-house scientists as well. Um, and the more we brainstormed together with these partners, the more connections we began to see. So um, we also worked with Framestore, who are the special effects company who brought to life a lot of the um, Beasts in the Fantastic Beasts films. And we also uh, worked with a couple of the illustrators for the Fantastic Beasts book, including Olivia Lomonet Gill. And it turns out she actually came to the museum as inspiration for her illustrations for one of the editions, illustrated editions of the book. So uh, lots of wonderful connections to explore. We were really spoilt for choice in the end. It's incredible actually to think there were so many parallels because you've got two very different worlds here. You know, the, the world of the Natural History Museum, which you know people associate with. Uh, with with dinosaurs, with with animals and, and plants and fossils from from all over the world, and of course the, the conservation of those things, and then you've got this, you know, um, multi billion dollar media franchise set in a fictional fantasy world, and and there are these parallels that bring them together. Um, who would have thought there would have been such a a natural pairing? Yeah, I mean, it's just at the core of it is a really simple message of the wonder of nature, whether it's real or magical, um, and a message of hope and a desire to protect those incredible creatures that we share our planet with. Um, so, so in a way, it, it was as simple as that. Fantastic. Um, Lorraine, if I could come to you next, I mentioned that you're the science lead on the exhibition. What does that actually mean? What, what do you do? Because a science lead on an exhibition about, about the wizarding world, I mean, that's a pretty uh, unique job description, isn't it? <laughs> it is, isn't it? Um, 
I think, uh, so the science lead for this exhibition, so I, I, I was assigned to do that role um, it, over two and a half years ago. And that really is to manage the role of science in terms of the people, any collections and the scientific content. So I work very closely with Kate and the interpretation team. I work with the, the museum's 300 plus scientists to see um, what we might have in the collections, what scientific messages we wanted to, to bring out. Um, and also um, loans. And so we actually um, made some requests for some loans as well for the exhibition, just to make sure that we covered all the subjects we wanted to. So a beautiful mermaid, um, a tapestry from the Victorian Albert Museum. So a lovely collection of over 130 items. And so the science lead also liaises with the scientists. Um, and I make sure that everyone signs off on the content because as, as a scientific institution, the Natural History Museum, we really want to get our message across, but we want it to be evidence based. You know, we're in this planetary emergency. And we want to make sure that the scientific content that we put out is accurately um, uh, reflected so that the, that the visitors can come and actually see that. So for each of the objects, we, we looked at what the science behind those objects were, what were the stories, what amazing abilities did some of these, these specimens have in real, in, 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 when they were alive, and also beautiful books and illustrations of explorers. So such a rich range of specimens and objects to work on. And then also working with uh, with the media and working with our museum digital team to to put things online. So for visitors who can't come to the museum, they can see something about the exhibition, but also learn more about our 80 million plus collection items. So we had a large number of scientists involved in this in this project from the very beginning. And uh, yeah, a lot, lot to coordinate, it sounds like, because um, with so many different specimens. Uh, featuring uh, in the exhibition and we're going to find out a bit more uh, during the show today uh, about some of them and you guys watching remember please do send us some questions if you've got anything at all you want to ask the panel uh, we'll, we'll put your questions to them um, and Richard if I could come to you next um, I mentioned you're, you're a curator uh, you look after uh, many of the specimens in the museum specifically uh, mammals is your your specialism did you ever imagine that some of the specimens that you care for would have ended up in an exhibition uh, quite like this one yeah, you know, it, it's 50-50 uh, it's really. Sometimes you think it's never going to happen. How could it ever happen that we're going to end up um, providing specimens from the science collections for an exhibition like this? But, you know, remember, this is the Natural History Museum and we do put some quite remarkable exhibitions on. Um, we, we've tackled some incredible themes over the years too. So it was, it was initially a bit of a surprise, to be honest with you, to be approached by Kate and Lorraine um, and asked for suggestions as to what might go into this exhibition but you know the more we had conversations that, and the more we sort of explored those parallels and the similarities to the world that have been created the wizarding world and actually the, the work that we do at the natural history museum our scientists in the field um, the curators working in the collections it just seemed like the right thing to do and and what a great audience to be able to um, reach out to you know the fans of, um, of harry potter and the wizarding world yeah absolutely i think that's a a big thing here because you know a lot of the animals uh, and some of the ones that we, we see, see in the images here, there are a lot of rare endangered animals that, that we're talking about in this exhibition, but putting them through the lens of the, the wizarding world is gonna bring those stories, I guess, to a, a whole audience that, that would not necessarily have engaged with these, with these stories before. Absolutely, it's a very, very good point and a very key point because, you know, um, the majority, I would say the great majority of the work that our scientists at the Natural History Museum do um, the, the the data that they generate, um, you know, is used to inform the uh, conservation management of, of um, uh, plants and animal species um, and whole ecosystems across the planet. Um, the 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 stories that are attached to the specimens from our collections, the um, the very real struggle that there's been by humans to save those animals, and the struggles of the animals themselves it's important i think always to be able to highlight those but also the positive work that's going on there's lots and lots of very positive messaging because there's a huge amount of very good work from um an incredible um range of people across the museum and also across the planet so it's really helping i think engage people and certainly younger generations not just younger generations but you know hey come on we want the next um generation of, of um museum scientists, zoologists, uh, whoever they may be, to, to be inspired and what a great platform to use. 
Absolutely, absolutely. Um, now, Kate, as, as an exhibitions manager, you know, how do you go about deciding what specimens to include? Because, you know, we've heard here from Richard and Lorraine about, you know, the, the, the excitement of um, the, the new sort of theme that we want to talk about these specimens through, this idea of the wizarding world. But, you know, we've got, what, 80 million specimens in the museum. Um, you know, how on earth do you start picking them? I mean, you must be working very closely with, with folk like Richard to kind of talk about what specimens do we have, what stories can they tell? Yeah, absolutely. It was quite a unique case for this exhibition because we started with the Fantastic Beasts. So we went through that A to Z of magical creatures, um, started becoming honorary magizoologists um, and started to pick out the similarities between magical creatures and real world animals, not just in their appearance, but also their behaviours, their abilities and also what threats they face. And then I think we took a, a long list of those magical creatures and we ran a workshop with Richard and many other of our scientists. I think it was around 30 in the workshop, but we, we worked with many, many more across the exhibition um, and just asked them to think outside the box for us, I guess, as to, to what connections we could draw with the real world um, and also with, that, with our scientific work. We also used the character of Newt Scamander to kind of anchor our, our narrative because we saw um, sort of three aspects to that character. One is, is in, in compiling that A to Z of, of magical beasts, it's, it's kind of building upon a long history of documenting the natural world. And when you go back through history, that wasn't always done on a, on a kind of first-hand basis. So we have a, a book in the exhibition by Edward Topsell. It's about 350 years old. And this is when kind of science, slightly more scientific thinking was starting to emerge. But there are a lot of second-hand accounts of these animals in there and you start to get some slightly strange depictions of real world animals but you also still have dragons unicorns griffins sitting alongside them um and and so that that fantastic beast book i guess had some strong parallels with that desire to document and understand the natural world um and they he also goes out and travels and and tries to see the magical creatures in their habitats so we wanted to draw parallels with the work of real world scientists um, working on the ground, seeing the behavior of these animals um, in, in their habitats. And then also, as I said, that role of a, a campaigner and a protector as well. So there was those kind of dual elements. We were, we were matching them to the Fantastic Beast, but also looking at those broader messages around the character of Newt Scamander, because we really wanted to reignite people's passion for the natural world and, and by using this wizarding world lens, get people to look at real world animals a little differently and sort of renew that curiosity. Um, I think one of the fun things about seeing the latest Fantastic Beast film is waiting to see what incredible magical creatures they, they've invented next. But you can find that that same passion in your own back garden. Uh, you know, I could go out there, dig through some leaves and I'm sure see something I've never seen before mm -hmm. if you look closely enough. So I think, yeah, after that, it was just a process of honing and balancing those two things, see, seeing where all those connections are strongest. Fantastic, yeah. And it's interesting, so would you say that the kind of, the key thing that you were really thinking about was, was conservation? Because I can imagine when you had the workshops with the scientists that a lot of them suddenly thought, hey, I think, I think I'm a lot like Newt Scamander in that sense that, you know, that's me. I, I, I care about fantastic beasts in, in the world and I want to, I want to try and, and preserve them and, and talk about them and, sh and, and, and educate people about them. Um, I, I'm sure quite a few scientists uh, maybe had that had that reaction. Um, it's interesting though hearing you um, talk about you know that that process of honing and, and selecting it because we've had a question come in from one of our viewers um, uh, that's asking about uh, which items were not included in the exhibition that you wish had been. Um, I, uh, do you want to highlight one or two uh, just now? I mean, maybe between the three of you, you might have a few, but Kate, I'll, I'll start with you. Yeah, so I, I did do a whole lot of research into sort of superstitions and symbolism of different animals. And, and personally, I, I love wolves. They're one of my favourite animals. And I'd done quite a lot of research on a section looking at wolves and werewolves and how um, these species have become sort of demonized essentially and, and potentially as a scapegoat for and you know a representation of wilderness of man's bestial nature there's there's so much complexity there and I find it really fascinating what we project onto animals sometimes 
sadly that didn't make it into the exhibition <laughs> but yeah it was it was really fun researching it fantastic and Lorraine did you have any anything that you wish could have made it in there well, I, you know, I'm a big spider woman. I love spiders. And so, you know, we, we've got we've got spiders featuring in the films and the books and the acumatula and things. And so we were going to have some props and some actual, you know, quite a few spider specimens. We, we've still got one in the exhibition. But yeah, yeah that was a bit sad because there was going to be a sort of, you know, a dark moment with a large spider. And we thought that it might even be quite scary for the public. But we did quite a lot of work on that. So that was a shame, but never mind. It's always nice to have a bigger choice, isn't it? And then you have to hone it. But something didn't, yeah, some things didn't make the cut. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know what? You've got to save something for next time because, you know, it's not going to be the last exhibition we, we ever make. <laughs> um, and Richard, quickly, was there, was there anything maybe from a mammal perspective that you wish had made it then? You know, I, I think we've done pretty well with, uh, with the representation of mammals in the exhibition. Um, I, of course, you probably uh, have noticed around me, I'm a big fan of the marine mammals um, and do a lot of work on those groups. But for my money, I think we've done pretty well um, with the representation of, uh, of animals from the sort of the aquatic realm, um, the giant squid, um, and of course, everything that's uh, associated with that, the, the early sort of uh, tall tales that were brought back by the, the sailors on those long voyages. Um, effectively for me to, to see more of the, the, of the mythology that surrounds bodies of water and that's not just the oceans that's that's lakes and rivers there's so much there's so many stories from countries around the world um it would have been wonderful to uh, to get a bit more of that in there but you know we've done fairly well i think i think yeah as i say there's a lot of stuff in there there to look at um now richard if i could stay with you we've had another question i think you might be um uh, best place to answer this one um uh Sissy's asking, how do you collect new, very rare and endangered animal specimens for the collections? Um, it's, I guess, you know, because we've mentioned there are a lot of endangered animals in this exhibition because that's part of our message we want to talk about. Um, but yeah, what, what, what's the story behind collecting these? It's a very, very good question. And it's, it's um, something obviously that this Natural History Museum, all of the scientists involved in field work and collecting um, are um, completely aware of. Uh, we have huge ethical considerations. We have considerations about the, um, not just the animals themselves, but also the countries that those animals are from. You know, if we are being, um, uh, taking part in a, um, uh, a study trip in a, a particular country, we're invited by that country. We're, we're part of a, uh, a team of, um, of scientists that's led by that country. We're providing our expertise to work with them. Now, in terms of collecting, um, we are in a completely different world now than we were, say, 100 years ago or even 50 years ago in some respects. We have a greater understanding of the fragility of um, the natural world. We have a greater understanding of um, the techniques that can be used to collect the kind of information that we need to study these species. You know, we're doing things, incredible things in this museum, like, for example, taking samples of water from a waterhole in Africa and then looking at the DNA from the saliva of all of those animals that have been down to drink from that waterhole in the past 24 hours, it's called environmental DNA studies. Um, the animals aren't harmed. In the, uh, to, to answer specifically the question that's been put, if a specimen is, is desirable for a museum collection, we have to know how that specimen was collected. We have to know um, everything about it. There has to be a complete paper trail. Everything has to be legal and agreed. Um, effectively, we want animals to remain in their natural environment, but there are times when we have to take samples. We can collect samples of hair, we can collect samples of poo, um, saliva, there's a whole range of things that we can do. My, my um, sort of short answer to the question is ethically and legally, mm. everything is done with um, minute detail and thinking these days. It's not just a case of going somewhere and collecting something and bringing it back anymore that can't happen and won't happen in the future. Yeah, well, I'm sure that will have reassured a lot of people um, because on the one hand, it's very exciting to see endangered things because a museum may be unfortunately the only place you could see them. Uh, but, you know, that, um, that's really great to know that there's that level of care and attention gone into to thinking about that now and, and, and how attitudes have changed, of course, in, in 100 years. Um, really good. Um, and you've also answered another question that we had in there, um, actually, uh, Richard, about um, uh, genetic material do does the museum have sort of genetic samples and um yes uh, i guess is, is the answer that you, that you said there it's it's a new 
aspect of the collection that wouldn't have existed when the museum was first uh, open. Absolutely. We have a, an excellent molecular collections facility. We have a very, very skilled um, molecular collections manager uh, and a great team of um, technical staff who are able to process samples that come in from field work and a whole range of other sources. Um, those molecular samples are held in minus 80 um, freezers and it's, it's an archive and it, it's an extension of what we call the traditional uh, research mm. collections that we have at the Natural History Museum. Um, and those collections, again, are utilized by scientists in-house here at the museum or from around the world. You know, this is a living, working, breathing collection and it's an international resource scientifically. Fantastic. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, guys, for your questions. Keep them coming. I'll put more of them to, to our panel today. Uh, it's really interesting to, to hear from everybody. Um, so, Richard, if I can stay with you for a moment, I want to, I want to talk to you about mythical uh, creatures because, you know, the whole wizarding world is very much inspired by sort of myths and legends and these have existed for probably as long as humans have existed on earth we've, we've, we've had this sort of passion for sh for sharing stories and legends passing them down through generations and and animals are an integral part of that are in, in your opinion are mythical creatures inspired by real animals that people would have seen because i think a lot of people you know, when we, we think about things like the giant squid or the, the unicorn, you know, these these are not completely alien things. They, they definitely look and feel like things that exist in the real world, but maybe just a little bit different. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, you know, th these animals, they have super sensory abilities compared to us humans. There are great things that we can do as a species, but there are some animals out there that just have these amazing abilities now taking those um, early voyages of discovery when um, Europeans were moving across the planet and they were um, exploring new areas and bringing back stories of the things that they'd seen, sometimes only sort of fleetingly glimpses of things in the ocean as they crossed the oceans. Um, it could be things like the giant squid. It could be that they were hearing the sounds of the, um, the animals uh, in the ocean. Um, imagine the sounds that are generated by you know, humpback whales um, and killer whales, clicks and moans and whistles and things passing through the wooden hulls of these ships um, as the sailors slept below decks at night. It must have been quite terrifying for them. But certainly um, the bodies of animals being washed upon beaches um, and also, you know, encountering things like, uh, like um, manatees. Uh, we have a beautiful skeleton of a, of a manatee in the um, exhibition, which talks to the, um, the whole sort of, mythology surrounding um, the mermaid. Uh, the manatee is, um, is present in, in various parts of, um, along the uh, Atlantic coast of, of North, Central and South America, but also over on the west coast of Africa. Um, the sailors who were moving across and, uh, and starting to explore that uh, American coastline would have been encountering these uh, manatees. And you know, they're, they're large, slow moving, hairless animals. Um, now, the, the the sort of the, the, the group name, the the, uh, the family name for the um, for the manatees, is Sirenia, um, and that speaks again to the, the mythology surrounding the, the, the sirens. You know, those mermaids that are depicted as as singing to sailors and kind of luring them onto the rocks, wrecking their ships, and then dragging the sailors down into the into the watery depths. Um, I'm not really sure that you would uh, uh, mistake a, a manatee for a for a mermaid necessarily. I mean, she's been at quite some time, but nonetheless, you know, you've got that beautiful kind of mythology, that background story, and and it never quite goes away. You know, oftentimes we we, we read about these stories when we're children, and then we go on to work in natural history. And so, even though you you sort of develop this scientific knowledge and awareness, those stories are still still there in the background; they never go away. Yeah, I was going to say, like you know, we we become familiar with almost mythical creatures before we actually grow up to learn about about the real thing uh, in some cases. Mermaids is a, is a really great example. You know, uh, I mean, I, I, remember, I remember watching The Little Mermaid as a, as a kid, you know, and, and uh, you know, that was in the, the, the late 80s. And um, I didn't learn about manatees until I was a few years older when I was, was on holiday and we, we got the opportunity to, to see them. So you can absolutely see why, you know, you, you, can, you just can't shake those, those images. And talking about mermaids, we've got an image that I want to, to share with people of, um, 
of, of what looks like an actual mermaid. Now, you said that uh, a manatee, I think you'd have had to have, have uh, drunk quite a lot of grog on the ship if uh, you came across a manatee and thought it, it looked like a mermaid. But um, we've got in the exhibition, actually, a, a specimen that, that looks a lot like a, what we might think a mermaid looks like, although I will say it's not the most attractive thing I've ever seen. Um, what's, what's going on here? We'll see if we can get the, uh, the picture. I, I know the specimen that you're referring to, um, and uh, hopefully we'll have the, uh, the image to accompany that, but um, it's a wonderful specimen that was loaned to us by Buxton Museum. It's known as the Buxton Mermaid. Um, and you'll see shortly that the, the, the specimen is actually made up of, of um, dry, there we go, dried um, fish, effectively um, the lower half of the, of the body is made up from, a, from the remains of dried fish. And then the rest is, is a, a beautiful kind of combination of um, modeling from wood. Um, they've used human hair, they've used wire, they've used um, fragments of shells and mother of pearl to, to give this sort of impression of a, a, a dried and mummified uh, mermaid. Now, as a child, I would have traveled across oceans and deserts to see this specimen because this is exactly the kind of thing that would have appealed to me and did appeal to me. And uh, it's gotta be one of my absolute knockout specimens to be honest in the in the uh, exhibition but it people believe this thing. these yeah. are things that are taken out of context they're taken from mythology you know and in the hands of a, of a convincing speaker in the hands of a, a very charismatic individual these things could have an awful lot of power uh, and did uh, they draw, drew huge crowds to um to side shows and carnivals um across europe and, and north america particularly but you know that it's amazing how widespread the the, the mermaid uh, myth actually is across the world it's incredible i mean i i think it's a fantastic specimen i really i really love it and do you know what it's making me think about um richard is you know we're talking about a fantastic beast the movie and of course in a production like that you have all these prop makers that make these incredible um uh props for the movie of, of these mythical creatures and of course you've got all the the cgi artists that you know make these creatures come to life on the screen. This feels to me almost like the, uh, you know, the, the early version of that, you know, someone trying to convince an audience about a mythical creature by, um, by creating something like this that looks remarkably lifelike because it's made from real things, as you say. Yeah, Incredible. absolutely. And yeah, uh, people love that. I still do. Excellent. Now, Lorraine, if I could um, uh, come back to you, know, we've seen a few of the specimens there that, that Richard's been, been, been talking about, uh, some uh, incredible stuff there that folk can see. Now you, you as the science lead, you, you're also a conservator. You work with specimens. I don't think there's a specimen in this exhibition that you and your team will not have had a very close uh, hand in preparing. How do you actually go about preparing things like this for display? Because there's some very unusual stuff in there um, for people to see. Tell us about that. Yeah, so uh, so we're working with Kate and Richard and other people. We develop what we call the specimen list, and so that's the 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 specimens and the objects we want to go into the exhibition. So that could be beautiful old historic books. In the image here, we've got a python skin, we've got a chameleon, we've got a number of specimens. So what we what we do is when we've identified that that is the object we want to go in, we do a condition check on it. What is its condition like? Does it need any particular treatments before it goes on display? We write a treatment proposal. Um, some specimens are more challenging than, the, than others, but we love that. So this amazing oarfish specimen that you can see here that the guys are carrying through so oarfish can grow up to eight meters long they're the largest bony fish in the world this is a, a very important scientific specimen in fact but it's in this old historic case the eyeball had dropped out it really needed quite a lot of cleaning so we had to kind of very carefully remove the case around it and treat it and then put that case back together and then it was too big to go in any lifts so the team one morning, we had to, to come out of one entrance and exit of the museum, walk a little bit along Exhibition Road and walk it in to, to another entrance of the museum. So quite an unusual sight for the public, I think, there. But um, we also work with mount makers so that if, if an item has to, to have a special mount to support it in the exhibition, that mount will be made. It's completely bespoke. Um, Kate and I were fortunate enough to go to Warner Brothers at studios, I can't possibly tell you where that is, or I would, you know, be excommunicated <laughs> um, to see the props. And so that was just so exciting. Here we've got a picture of an Okapi taxidermy specimen, really beautiful specimen. We're literally just installing it here. So the installation phase, once everything is ready, 
That was about eight weeks. And that was towards the end of last year during actually lockdown pandemic. So we had the team coming on site every day. Um, having to be very careful about how we were working and installing each single specimen into these display cases and the graphics and everything that goes with that. And at the same time, we actually had some of, I think Channel 5 were filming us for a documentary. We had some of our own film crews. So we it was, it was, it was a really busy time, but it was so exciting. And the team, you could see from the team, the excitement building up, the conservation work that they'd done on these specimens and then putting them on display and then when we got to open in December, the public coming in and seeing them and not really being aware, perhaps, of all the work that goes on behind the scenes to get those specimens ready for exhibition. But it was a really enjoyable um, exhibition to put together and we've really loved doing it. I can imagine. It must be so satisfying, you know, as you say, Lorraine, you've been working on this for years. And then and not only that, but, you know, like everyone, we've been working through a pandemic, which just you know has made so many things that much more difficult. And then to actually see it there you know, to walk in and see the public enjoying it finally um, must be, you know, so so satisfying. And particularly because there are so many unusual things in here that you can't just, you know, take the specimen and put it on a shelf and, and that's job done. As you say, everything is, everything's bespoke, every sort of display case and, and plinth and something has had to be carefully thought out, constructed, um, so that it, everything looks absolutely at its best in the exhibition. Oh, absolutely. And that python skin, you know, it was we had to unroll it and then mount it very carefully on a card and then display it vertically. So that was a massive challenge for the team. And um, but we loved it. We love a challenge. We like a specimen that needs a lot of, you know, attention and challenges, because for us, that's even more satisfying that we can then put that on display. And um, and the theme of the exhibition was really interesting for us as well, to have our specimens alongside some of these amazing props and models. It was just a fantastic experience. And on that note, Lorraine, we, we had a question come through um, asking about, are there any recreations of Harry Potter and the Fantastic Beasts creatures in the exhibition? Um, so obviously we've got, we know we've got lots of specimens, but did we actually have any of the beasts from the, from the film and, and how did we go about making those? So the, so we've got props, we've had props from Warner Brother, uh, Warner Brother Studios, the, the prop store, so they're, they're scattered amongst the exhibition. Um, but we also had, you know, in the films they used a lot of CGI, so there wasn't actually, we couldn't actually borrow a prop of some things. So we we worked with uh, with a couple of companies, um, one was called Mangostone to, to, and Warner Brothers to recreate a, a model. So moon calves, um, we've got the big dragon head, those models were, 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 were recreated for the exhibition, um, but otherwise we did have quite a few props um, from from Warner Brothers. And then we also work with the company called Frame Store to actually produce some, um, some actually film and interactive. So we've got an amazing bow truckle tree with these bow truckles on it. And if you go towards it, they kind of get angry and want to protect the tree. So there's a there's a nice rich immersion of specimens and, and um, other immersive experience. And we worked across all these teams. And so it was really, we had to be quite creative sometimes to recreate um, some of those fantastic beasts, but um, I think the results say say for themselves. I can imagine they certainly certainly do. Excellent. Thanks. Thanks very much, Therene. Now, um, Kate, if I could could come to you next. Um, um, I imagine there must be a very long process of iteration when you're building something like this, because you know you mentioned that you've got you kind of come up with your key idea. You've you've talked about. Newt Scamander, the main character in the in the movie in the book, as kind of the the central figure of it uh, and conservation. But then, when you're working with Lorraine and Richard and, and and all the scientists at the museum, you must sort of start to change, you know, things that go in, or or maybe they go into the exhibition. And you think actually they'd be better placed in a different way. You know, is that that there must be a long process like that? Is that is that true? Yeah, that's definitely true. Um, we, I think mainly we worked really closely with our brilliant in-house design team. Um, and I think once we've got that that long list of specimens that we've talked about, it's then a case of what, what else is going in the space um, and what do we want that space to be like? So we, we kind of desi divided the, the exhibition into three zones, one of which looks at the, the kind of myths and legends, the, those Kind of mythical creatures that that are built upon in the wisting world so things like dragons unicorns mer people um, and we wanted that to feel like a kind of magical museum like you're kind of you've you've turned an odd corner in the nhm and discovered this this mystical gallery of, of magical creatures um 
so that that has a, a, a very much museum like feel in that first space. We worked with our technical production team to make some really fun elements like opening and cl closing drawers and doors, um, some cupboards that you can open and hear that um, the shriek of a mermaid or, or a whale song. Um, and then in the, the, the central area, we then wanted to look at Newt Scamander as an explorer. So we wanted people to feel like they were going on their own adventure in the wild to uncover magical and real animals and to observe their behaviors. And then in the final area, um, we came back to this idea of, of Newt caring for magical creatures and took a reference of the basement that you see um, in the second film where he kind of has a hospital for magical creatures. And we wanted to play on that idea um, in, in that there's the, there's portals to little habitats for the animals. And we wanted to play on that idea of having these, these precious areas where these animals are cared for. Um, so yeah, there's a whole design process that then pushes and pulls on the content. You know, it might mean that we can't fit everything that we want to in, um, you know, it might reflect what feels best in that space. So, um, you know, when we were looking at being at kind of out in the wild finding animals, we had a whole section on camouflage. And so we were able to do some nice playful things with sort of blending them and having dappled lighting and things like that to bring, to kind of help communicate, for example, the dappled pattern of a jaguar. So the design has a massive influence as well on, on how we display those specimens, how they're best arranged. And then as um, Lorraine just hinted to, we also had all of these props from Warner Brothers that we wanted to include. So we tried to then marry up each beast with a prop from the film um, and with the specimens from our own collections and also some way of bringing that creature to life. So whether that was these fantastic models of the moon calves that we had made, which I think was the first time that they'd been kind of realized physically, which was really exciting, they're very cute, um, or whether it was through a digital means. So as we said, we worked with Framestore and some of their, their CGI assets of the creatures. So we, we have a, an exhibit where you can lure a, a, a rumpant over to you and see if you can coax it into doing its courtship dance. Um, so there's, yeah, a really fun combination of creative elements um, and all sorts going on, as I said, in our technical production team, rattling teapots and opening cupboards. And so, yeah, a lot of magic to sprinkle on top as well. So it sounds like a lot of fun that it's not just thinking about what specimens you put in, but like, how can we bring the whole space to life in a, in a more kind of immersive magical way if i can use if i can use that word um brilliant thanks thanks kate um thank you guys for your questions um please do keep them coming um we've had another question come in um and this is quite interesting I'm actually thinking about what you've just been saying kate about how how much has gone in there not just specimen wise but the kind of immersive aspect of it um we've got a question about asking is the exhibition going to tour um are people going to be able to see this beyond the museum in london yes absolutely yeah. yeah. <laughs> Five years um, and it starts next year and we're in discussions. Everyone in the world, every venue wants this exhibition, by the way. <laughs> um, so we're we're in discussions with a number of institutions um, for touring it for sure, because it's been it, we always wanted to do that, really. So it's also about sharing our collections and our science globally. Um, so, yeah, next year. Fantastic. There you go. So it's uh, it's going to be coming. Uh, hopefully to a museum near you at some point in the future. Excellent. Uh, another question that's come in, uh, this one uh, from Anna, uh, this one is, has creating this exhibit changed anything about the way you will design other exhibits in the future? Um, interesting question. I don't know, maybe, Kate, are you maybe best placed to, to answer that one? Has it changed the way you think about designing exhibitions going forward? Definitely. Yeah, I, I think, as I said, it was a really new creative challenge for us to to tread that very delicate line between between magic and the real. Um, and I think as we had to be quite creative, bringing those magical beasts to life, it certainly gave us some new ideas about sort of bringing a creature to life in a space and enabling you to interact with it um, and what that means. And yeah, I, I think because it's still a really specimen rich exhibition as well, there's, there's, as Rain's already said, there's so many objects in there, but I think we have managed to balance that with a really, really beautiful setting and a lot of um, of other yeah, interactive things to get involved with, some films. Um, so it's, it's a really rich mix. And I think we've learned a lot from that process. We've It's, it's probably one of the most ambitious ex exhibitions we've ever done. So 
Um, well, it's, yeah, it sounds, like it's, it's, it sounds like it's been worth it. We've, we've had lots of comments folks saying how much they've enjoyed it and had fun with it. So um, that, that, for those that have been there already. So yeah, well done. I think uh, it's, it's, great going, <laughs> it's, it's gone down well. Um, all right. Um, so we've, we've only got about five minutes left and uh, I still have uh, stuff. I, I could, we could probably talk all day about, about the exhibition, but I wanted to um, come back to Richard um, if I could. So Richard, I mentioned, you know, you're, you're a mammal curator. You're particularly interested in um, cetaceans, whales, dolphins, porpoises, I know. And there's, um, there's one specimen that has featured in the exhibition that's particularly important to you that I know you, you really do want to talk about. Um, the vaquita. Now, this, I have to admit, this is not an animal that I'd heard of uh, before this exhibition. Um, and uh, I imagine that might be the case for a lot of people. Um, can you tell us a bit more about what it is and, and why it's featured in the exhibition? Because this is exactly the kind of thing that, that was perfect for this, this sort of exhibition, wasn't it? Yeah, for sure. Um, it's, it, the vaquita is, uh, is a type of porpoise. Uh, it's known as the Gulf of California porpoise. You find it in the, sort of the northern portions of the Gulf of um, California. Um, it's the smallest um, cetacean species. It's the smallest of all of the whales, dolphins and porpoises. And about one and a half meters long. Um, the problem with this particular animal is that over the decades there's been an increase in illegal fishing activities and other activities which have um, meant that these animals have been dying in huge numbers um, as non what we call non-target species being caught in, in the nets which have been set to um, catch uh, fish uh, and it's the fish themselves that are bringing very, very high prices in various parts of the world. These illegal fishing activities um, have put the porpoise um, at great risk and of course now unfortunately led to um, an acceleration in its decline. Um, we wanted to have this as an example of um, what can happen to a, um, a, a, an animal species or any species in fact, that um, it's, it's something that we, we don't yet still fully understand you know there's still an awful lot that scientists have got to learn about the natural world and we we know that we're learning all the time um but it's so sad when you you actually lose a species before you fully understand and appreciate its significance its position in its ecosystem the role it plays in um, maintaining the balance within that ecosystem its feeding patterns its breeding um, behavior um, a whole range of things that we still don't understand and unfortunately um, we may, before the end of the exhibition at the Natural History Museum, be looking at the um, what we call the functional extinction. I hope not, but it may be that we reach that point where there are no longer any of these animals left in the wild, that there are only those left in um, captive um, uh, settings where they're being held to try and preserve the species and hopefully for um, re-release uh, later on in time. But, you know, this is a platform that is reaching through the wizarding world um, a very, very broad, diverse, um, creative, thoughtful, and I think empathic audience. You know, there are obviously people who um, um, love wizarding worlds uh, and fantastic beasts particularly feel that sense of connection to, to nature, whether it's um, through um, uh, um, the world of fantasy or what we have in our own very real world. Why not tell this story? Um, there is a lot of positivity. There are people working very hard to preserve this animal and others uh, across the planet. But we may be just that little bit too late with this species, unfortunately. But I think it's important that people know that this is going on. Our world is in a very, very sort of um, crucial um, point of balance at the moment. And it's the action that we take now that's going to hopefully preserve species like this going forward into the future for our children and grandchildren to enjoy in the wild. Yeah. No, it's, it's it's a really sad story, and I mean, great to know that there are folk working really hard to to try and, and bring that species back from the brink. And again, you can see that it's exactly the kind of thing that the character of Newt would have wanted to to protect. Um, and uh, I'm sure by raising awareness through an exhibition like this, that's only going to help the more people know about these animals. Because if you don't know about something, you don't you can't protect it if you don't know about it. So um, hopefully, that's that's bringing its attention of of, uh, of more people. Um, fantastic. Um, so very, very uh, quickly, we've, we've, we're just about out of time, but I wanted to ask if we can go around the group and uh, you could tell me what's what's your favourite thing in the exhibition? Now, you, you're probably going to say it's like 
picking your favorite child. You can't do it. But if I'm, I'm going to put you each on the spot and ask you to tell me your favorite uh, specimen in the exhibition that folk can look out for when, when they go and visit. So, um, Kate, I'm going to start with you. Uh, what would be your highlight favorite specimen you want people to look for? It's a tough one. Um, I worked on the section about bow truckles. So these are a magical creature. If you've seen the films, uh, Newt Scamander carries around a, uh, one called Picket with him and they uh, they protect wandwood trees in the magical world. So if you try and take wood from a tree, they'll, they'll jump down and attack you, though they can be placated with wood lice. Um, and when I was looking at um, equivalents in the natural world, I was looking for mutualisms where one, one or more species help to defend or protect another. And I went down an absolute wormhole of, of scientific papers about acacia ants. Um, and this is a story about the whistling thorn acacia and the acacia ant that lives in it. And you can see these uh, sort of swollen bases of these thorns here where the, the ants actually live inside these. Um, and when a large herbivore like a giraffe or an elephant comes to browse on them, they'll swarm out and attack them. But there was a really interesting study done where they excluded large herbivores from an area of land and something quite unexpected happened. You'd expect maybe once once the kind of browsing pressure is, is relieved that the trees would do better, but they actually um, were less healthy because they they stopped producing those swollen thorns once they they kind of weren't receiving that, that kind of stimulus from, from the herbivores eating them. And they were colonized quite often by a different species of acacia ant that is less beneficial for the tree. So instead of um, defending, they, they are still somewhat aggressive, but they they encourage a, a boring beetle that bores holes into the, the stem of the plant. And they live in there instead of in those swollen thorns. And that actually damages the tree's health. So it was a really amazing story of, of this kind of unexpected impact of the removal of large herbivores from that habitat. And you can imagine that the implications, the unexpected implications of the extinction of large herbivores as a result of that. And also the incredibly crucial and subtle and, and perhaps unobserved role of that, that tiny ant in this ecosystem. So that was my favourite story. <laughs> Excellent. Really good one there. Uh, lots to think about, Kate. Thank you. Uh, Lorraine, your favourite uh, highlight? I think a highlight for me is, 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 is actually a display case in what we call the Explorer's Hut. So uh, just as you come through the first area of the, the, the exhibition, you go into being an explorer yourself. There's a display case which is showing some of Newt Scamander's, uh, so his suitcase and... Um, and things like that, but um, his passport, but also it's got explorer equipment from our own collections um, going back hundreds of years where they would be taking the rucksack, the hobnail boots, the sort of butterfly nets, the tins of bovril, just an amazing cacophony of specimens in this, this display case, which gives you an idea about what was it like to be an explorer and, and all the notebooks and the beautiful illustrations. So when I stare at that case and it's got lots of things in it, I'm just lost in a world of exploring. And I just, every time I look at that case, I can see more and more things. And so that for me is a really enjoyable part of the exhibition. Excellent, thank you, Lorraine. Good one to look out for. And Richard, finally, your, your favorite. Um, you said it would be as difficult as trying to name your favorite child. I have to <laughs> say, uh, if I had a child, I would hope it looks something like the Buxton Mermaid. Uh, <laughs> purely and simply because I just love it. I mean, it appeals to the child in me. Um, and it's that wonderful kind of, you know, um, authentic fakery that, that um, has been around for centuries. And, you know, it's got one foot in each camp. It's got one foot in the real world and one foot in the in the, in the wizarding world, effectively. Um, yeah, it's a genuine fact. I love it. I just love it. It's, it's well worth it. Absolutely. Yeah, I think um, I, I, that's a contender for probably my favourite as well, uh, Richard. I'm with you there. Um, I just find that kind of stuff fascinating. Um, it looks like, you know, myth brought to life in, in front of you. Excellent. Well, thank you so much uh, to to Richard, Lorraine and Kate for, for talking with us today. It's been really fascinating to get that insight and, and your different perspectives um, on the exhibition. Um, it's it's uh, you, you've all done a you and, and your teams have done such an amazing job of bringing these two different worlds together in such a, an unusual and, and unique way. So thank you very much, all of you, for, for joining us today and all the very best for, um, for the rest of the exhibition run and 
um, all the future exhibitions to come. I mean, there's definitely stuff on the cutting room floor, so I fully expect to see a, a follow-up uh, in a few years of uh, some highlights. So um, get on that now, guys. But <laughs> thank you so much, everyone, and, uh, and all the best. And thank you guys as well for joining us today. Unfortunately, that is all we've got time for. Um, but uh, hopefully that has piqued your interest in exploring Fantastic Beasts, the wonder of nature for yourself. If you want to uh, have a look, then pop down to the Natural History Museum in London. The exhibition is now open. You can book your tickets online via the museum website. And while you're there, take a moment to explore Exhibition Road, uh, the inspiration behind the Great Exhibition Road Festival, where you'll find other cultural landmarks as well like the Science Museum and the Victoria and Albert Museum, to name a few. Uh, if you'd like to find out more about the festival and the wider programme, then head over to the Great Exhibition Road uh, website. You can find it at greatexhibitionroadfestival.co.uk for all the details. But thank you very much for watching today and for all your questions. I hope you've enjoyed it and we hope to see you again very soon. Thank you.